Hello, this is Gerd Leonhardt, Futurist and CEO of the Futures Agency. We're having a conversation today with two colleagues about digital transformation. The first topic will be the digital transformation of the telecom communications business. We have Simon Torrens over here. He'll, he'll introduce himself shortly. And then we have uh, Rohit Talvar, futurist from London. Why don't we start with Simon, just briefly tell us what you do, and then we'll jump to the topic. Uh, yes, you know, so thanks, Gert. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I spend most of my time looking at how the telecoms industry needs to evolve and adapt. Um, and I, in the past, I created a research program called Telco 2.0, which is all about looking at the next, uh, I guess, the next iteration of the telco business model and the role of telcos in the wider digital economy. In fact, this has become sort of the war cry of the telecom companies, right? They all want to be 2.0 now. <laughs> well, they do. They're all about, I'd say they're all about 0.9 at the moment, but they, they have the ambition of getting to okay. 2.0 one day. Yeah. Well, we have to help them with that. Rohit, tell us briefly what you do. Hi, I'm Rohit Tawa. I run a company called Fast Future in London. Um, we help clients in telecoms, media and technology to understand the forces, the trends, the technologies that could shape the next five to 20 years. We focus in particular on what are the new concepts to take to the market, what new business models do you need to be driving and how do you actually drive that transformation inside your organisation to embrace what's coming next and evolve quickly from one model to the next at the speed at which markets are changing. Great. So I'm Gerd Leonhardt, Futurist and CEO of the Futures Agency. Uh, to our members, we have several other members, but we focus on these kind of conversations about discovering what uh, somebody's future, a company's future could be and how we get to your preferred future. Uh, the three of us have done quite a few telecom things together, including the ITU Doha World uh, Summit on the future in December last year in Doha. So the first question I have you know, that I want to discuss is you mentioned Telco 2.0. And this, in fact, is kind of an old meme, right? It's 10 years old. But now we're reading, just I read a couple of days ago about MTN now bundling streaming into the, uh, the network. And of course, Digicel doing the same and everybody else. Are we finally actually getting there? Are we getting 2.0 or are we still early? Well, we're still, I, I suppose it depends what 2.0 means. I mean, I, I tend to see it as the next iteration of their core business model. And of course, the telcos, their main business model has been to sell you and I connectivity, you know, making phone calls or accessing the web, and occasionally they add some TV into that as well. And uh, that's been very extremely successful for the, particularly the mobile industry for the last 20 years, uh, partly, I think, because it's a scarce resource they're selling. They, they get a license for Spectrum. There's only two or three of them in a the market, or maybe four. Um, and everybody wants to be connected. So everybody wants to have a mobile phone, everybody gets a mobile phone, and the only way you can go to do it, to get connected, is to a mobile operator, and they can set a, a price, and they've been extremely good at uh, monetizing that scarce resource, which is the, the unique spectrum that the government has, has, has uh, sold. But, but now everybody does that, more or less, right? So, so Robert, you, you were there with us in Doha, uh, and you do some telecom stuff, but you do many other things. What was your observation of, of the issues? So I think what we see is that telecoms companies around the world are struggling with four things. One is, what is it we do in the future? You know, Simon's just articulated a lot of those services, but what is it that we're providing to our end users in terms of the range of platforms, services? The second is, what technologies do we need to master to make that happen? Because the technology is evolving so quickly. The third is what do we actually look like? What's our shape? Are we just a brand buying everything from a whole range of other players? Or are we trying to master all the underlying capabilities ourselves? And then the fourth is what's our business model? How do we actually do this in a way that we can make money and not just become some giant debt machine? And what we see is that every operator we talk to around the world is struggling with these issues. They used to know exactly what the story was. Now they're in a world where it's a rapidly changing reality what we thought was the right model last year is already out of date this year or has already been demonstrated to be unviable in a, in a two or three year time, time and frame. And you know, I, I find in this context, this conversation that I'm having a lot with operators because there's been so many over the years, is that, that they intellectually understand the challenge and the possibilities. Uh, they're looking at themselves and saying, you know, God, you know, we are so strictly measured by the stock markets. We're very risk adverse. We invest a lot in LTE and 5G and whatever, right? Yeah. But this kind of giant leap of becoming the next generation of who they are, yeah. reinventing themselves like Tesla has reinvented cars or like Amazon has been reinventing reading, you know, that, that seems like a 
very, very unnatural thing. Right? This is the main thing that I'm observing. And so I always feel like, you know, our work has been about prodding them to, or maybe scaring them in many ways, to take that leap, you know, how, how do you think that's going to happen, actually? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, sorry, you, you're right. I mean, they are infrastructure businesses by background. They're, they're, they're run by um, finance people and engineers, and they create life-critical networks that work guaranteed. You know, that's, that's what they're good at, or most of the time they work. Um, and uh, as I said, they've been making so much money from that model. It's been very successful in the past, but that is now that's reached the sort of plateau. So that, as you say, they need to come up with something different. And they do instinctively know, as you say, that they have a whole load of great assets and capabilities within that network, within the fact that everybody has a phone and the amount of data that we're generating about our the personal data, the information about ourselves that we're generating the whole time as, as we move around the world. They do recognize that. And as you say, um, in principle, they recognize they could leverage that and create new um, sources of, of value and therefore new sources of revenue by opening up that capability to other people who want to use it. Um, but when you speak to when you speak to them time after time, the, or the senior managers who are trying to create these new types of business models, what they'll say is it's the it's the culture that stops us from doing it. It's the mindset. How do how do we get them to transform? I mean, do we go in with like a giant like a, a future shock uh, and and scare them to submission, or you know how do they how will they actually change? I think future shock doesn't work anymore now because they've had that for the last few years right. and they're almost paralyzed by, if you're a leader in an organization, you're almost paralyzed by the number of people coming and telling you that you're facing disruption, that you need to change everything. And as Simon says, it, it's this issue of culture uh, and the organization itself. You have 5,000, 10,000, 100,000 staff who you've spent 20 years perfecting into thinking in a certain way, behaving in a certain way. And now we're saying, no, You've got to be entrepreneurial, you've got to be dynamic. What we did last year, we're not necessarily doing this year. And you've got to think very differently. And that's a very big shift. And unfortunately, whilst the technologies move very, very fast, people don't. Well, this and we have good. to accept that it's going to take a while. And, and yeah. that's where organizations need to be going through the change programs to get them, their management and their, the, the rest of their organization waking up to what's changing and start to get this mindset change going inside the organization. And we just have to accept that you can't accelerate that. Yeah, I, th I think part of it is, is working out what's your purpose. I mean, part of the problem is that um, they, they're, they're, they tell the telcos, particularly very successful organizations, making lots of money, and they have shareholders who, who are expecting a certain rate of return. And in the volatile markets these days, telcos are pretty sta are quite stable. They're not the exciting growth businesses. Um, and so there's a there's a danger there's an opportunity I guess is to reinvent why you exist what's your purpose in life, and we talked about these these sort of life critical networks that they they run. If you're doing, you know, if if, if uh, people are doing robotic surgery these days, which is already a service, the network's got to work for that. You know, mm -hmm. so 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 I, I had a meeting with some uh, senior management team actually only this this week, and they're a very successful company. They they they. Uh, in terms of the quad play, as we call it, that TV and, and, and so on. And um, they were looking for the next wave of growth. And uh, what we started to explore with them is that could you not be, as the, as the rest of the economy in your, the country that you operate is becoming digital, there is the digital economy being created, could you not be the innovation platform for that digital economy? The, the, the platform that allows other people to innovate, to serve consumers in that digital world. So rather than you trying to come up with services yourself, trying to come up with OTT services or new entertainment services, let other people do it on your platform. And what, what grabbed their attention was when you start to talk about the internet businesses, which the most successful ones are all platforms. They create capabilities that other people uh, innovate on top of. Or and then they know, take off. The challenge there is if you, are, if you are already a pipeline or a network, it's very hard to mutate to a platform <laughs> and vice versa. So, Let's wrap up this session because uh, we're going to talk about digital transformation in general, like we just started to mm. in a separate session. Let's wrap up with three uh, predictions of what's going to happen with telecom in the next five years. Mm. I'll take a start. And then, mm. So three short things about what their destination is. My view is, I've said for years, you know, we're heading into what I call the telemedia economy, which is convergence of telecom and media. So content and network converging right? in advertising as part of that, as part of media is. Right? So that, that's going to be a very, very clear cut thing. The Internet of Things connecting everything, a whole new business model. Uh, part of that is the whole discussion about big data and paying for privacy, mm -hmm. all these extra services. 
and of course automation, virtualization, cloud computing, those are giant businesses that they're all going to get into. Mm -hmm. Key question there will be about ultimately about uh, they are going to become very much a platform mm -hmm. rather than a network. Mm -hmm. and the network will be underneath the platform exactly. rather than will be the central part of what it yeah. is. I think you've just done at least 30 of the three predictions that we, could, <laughs> we might cover. Um, I think that, so building on what you've said, I, I think there's a few things. Uh, one is we're going to see a big uh, spreading out in terms of those that get it, that get how the world's changing, and those who are still stuck in this very old fashioned kind of, we're just part of government type thinking. Those who get it will start to change the way they think, the way they manage, and, and the way they look for opportunity and partner in the marketplace to bring it to market. The second is, I think one of the things that we're going to see hitting all of these guys is, is the kind of rapid wave of increasingly intelligent software. Uh, not fully artificially intelligent, but more and more almost lights out operation of everything they do, dynamic reconfiguration of the network, dynamic pricing models, uh, and just an increasingly intelligent network which will need less and less people. The third thing I think we're going to see is a lot of new entrants because the actual uh, the underlying pipes, the networks now are a very small piece of what's going to come next. So we might see a few players providing the pipe work, but an awful lot of people filling the role that the traditional telecoms companies played in terms of being that platform provider between the marketplace uh, of solution providers and the end consumer. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. yeah, I think I think in many ways some of the things that have, I suppose, held them back culturally in terms of. Um, five nines culture, everything having to be completely robust before they launch it. Actually, as the world becomes more digital, more connected, and we talk about the internet of everything, and not just the internet of things, the internet of everything, that requires increasingly uh, network intelligence, and it requires security to make it work. As I said, you know, things like robotic surgery, if that doesn't, if, if the network goes down, that's a disaster. Um, so I think in many ways, if they can, they're going to play an even stronger role in the digital economy. And there's a lovely description of the digital economy, which is uh, all economic activity mediated by software, but um, enabled by telecoms networks. And I think they have that, that role, that very strong role to play to enable that. And I think if they just look a little bit over the parapet about where the digital economy is moving, what their assets and capabilities they could expose into that, I think they've got a very bright future, but it just needs a, sli a little slight uh, <laughs> change in mindset and a little bit more, and a, and a little bit of thinking about what's our role in the world. I think. I think in general, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but my observation has been that this is mostly happening in developing countries and in regions that are that are hungry for their future. In Europe, we have a problem of regulation; everything is regulated. In America, it's a, one big country where they're satisfied with themselves, so to speak. Yeah. But if you're looking at operators like MTN and others, you know who have huge diversity of countries yeah. and they can do all kinds of interesting things because they have to reinvent their future yeah. so this will come out of africa will come out of south america the caribbean yeah. it will come out of uh, india will come out of indonesia in my view yeah. not from europe i don't know i think it will i think just on different levels so so in those emerging markets that's where you get the service innovation and then things like the you know mobile money transfer and mpays and so on because you're, you're solving really important things but I think back here or in the West or in, in mature markets, then because the rest of the economy in which they operate is going digital, they are, they are they're requiring cloud services and secure networks and the telcos are good at providing that. So I think they'll just be, they'll be innovating, but in a different way, I think. So Robert, bad cards for Europe or good cards for Europe? What do you Let's call it uh, the UK also part of Europe. Yeah, for, we can, we for, get for this practical yeah. purpose. Yeah. <laughs> UK, Europe, what's the, uh, are we in a good position there? Or? I don't think it's a case of saying we're in a good or bad position. I think you almost have to go down to the country level. And the same with the developing economies. What we see is those where you've got progressive government, progressive regulators who are open to new roles mm. for the players in the economy. Yes. You're going to see some quite dramatic stuff happening. Mm. So you'll see your telecoms players being a platform for education in some countries. Mm. Same in the, in, in the so-called mature economies, where the regulators get it, where governments recognize that shift has to happen quickly, you'll see the market reconfigure, you'll see small companies, you know, we're seeing them in other sectors where you've got 20 employees and they're being valued at 20 billion because of the market impact they can have. So we're gonna, I think we'll see a lot of innovation, maybe the ideas coming more from the West, but actually being adopted in all sorts of places around the world as test cases. Uh, and the other thing I think we're going to see is 
a lot of new kind of financing mechanisms, which we haven't really got time to talk about. But what we're seeing is a kind of radical shift in the way that you, you finance innovation. And I think that is going to make it a lot easier for people to bring game changing ideas mm -hmm. to market. Okay, we have to wrap. We're going to go back to a few more sessions about digital transformation. Um, we have with us Simon Torrance, uh, tele Telecom 2.0 expert and, and, uh, and internationally known for his knowledge about telecom. We have Robert Talva, futurist from Fast Futures, myself, uh, Gerd Leonhardt from the Futures Agency. We're all working together there. If you want more information, it's thefuturesagency.com. Thanks for tuning in.